Greetings, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for today's joint webinar between iMickey and FM Global. The topic that you hopefully have logged into is the steam turbine safety devices, a path to resilience. Uh, we've, we've had, had some interesting, interesting technical problems this morning, as, as we have all probably experienced when we've, we've been working from home using remote tech. So hopefully you can hear me and you can see me, and, and hopefully this will go OK. okay. Uh, let me introduce myself, first of all. My name is Simon Baker Chambers. I am the manager for global sales responsible for EMEA at FM Global. Uh, delighted to be hosting this webinar for you guys today. Um, I will, I will introduce, introduce our speaker. Our speaker, our speaker is uh, a colleague, colleague of mine, mine Donovan de Santos. Donovan is an account engineer specializing in power generation uh, at FM Global, Global, based in the UK. Uh, Donovan has, uh, prior to moving to the insurance industry, Donovan has worked at uh, one of the world's largest synthetic fuel refineries in a variety of engineering operations management roles. Um, and also including uh, being the maintenance manager of an 800 megawatt captive power station. So Donovan also comes from industry like uh, much of you on the call today. Um, on the call today in the audience, we have a broad selection of people filing in. So thank you for joining us. We have IMICI members, IMICI non-members, operators, owners, OEMs, uh, consultants, finance professionals, Insurance, insurance brokers, and, and last but not least, least I believe we also have some FM Global clients, clients, so welcome to all of you. Some, some housekeeping rules. Um, the presentation will run for about 25 minutes. Um, at the end of the 25 minutes, there will be a live Q&A for approximately another 25 or 30 minutes or so. Um, I will then look to close out and have us done within an hour uh, overall. So, so we, we look, look to be finished by 1300 hours uh, UK time. Um, if you would like to pose questions using the chat function in the webinar, you can do that as we go along. The Q&A will be addressed at the end of the session. I will be monitoring the, que the questions through the presentation and I will handle that directly with Donovan once we get to the end. So. Please, Please do interact. This hopefully will be an interactive session. Uh, interested to get your questions and see if we can answer as many of those as possible. So please do post your chat as you go. I'll organize those and we'll handle those at the end. Um, the other thing that I will add is that the copy of this presentation will be made available to everybody who's registered uh, at the uh, end of this event. I believe, I believe I've covered everything, everything I need to. Uh, thank, thank you once again for joining this presentation. Delighted to have you. Um, and I will now hand over to my colleague, Donovan de Santos. Enjoy, and I'll talk to you in 25 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Today, I will be discussing some relatively simple actions which steam turbine operators can, and in our opinion, should take to improve the resilience of their machines. I'll start off with some background on FM Global, who we are, what we do, and how that gives us some unique insights into asset management generally, but more specifically steam turbines. From there, we'll delve into the details of turbine safety devices, spending a bit of time exploring what safety devices are, why they are necessary, and how to maximize their reliability. Finally, we'll review organic safety devices and what needs to be in place to get the most out of them. Depending on your perspective, FM Global is either an insurance company with an engineering bias or an engineering company with an insurance bias. 180 years ago, a textile mill owner in Rhode Island attempted to reduce his insurance premiums by making property improvements that he believed would minimize the damage in case of fire. Despite considerable investment, the insurers of the day did not share his view, so he called upon like-minded mill owners similarly committed to loss prevention to create a mutual insurance company that would only insure factories with lower risks. This was the beginning of the factory mutual group, and today FM Global remains a mutual insurance company owned by clients who share the belief that the majority of loss is preventable. 
research, engineering expertise, and almost two centuries of loss prevention experience are combined to provide our clients with advice on the best way to prevent and minimize the impact of insurable events. Of our 5,500 employees, 1,860 are in engineering roles, whilst more than 1,000 more are qualified engineers that have moved into other roles within the organizations. Those engineers consult with a broad range of clients, from soft occupancies like hotels and high-rise offices, to high-hazard occupancies such as power generation and chemical manufacturing. Those engineers who work with clients operating steam turbines have a range of relevant industry experience. Some, like myself, started their careers operating and managing turbines in power stations, whilst others did the same in other environments, such as the Royal Navy or in pulp and paper mills, or for turbine OEMs themselves. Regardless of background, all have received extensive specialized loss prevention training to be able to apply that industry experience to the field of loss prevention. Across our book of business, we insure more than a thousand steam turbines, ranging in size from small industrial units putting out a few megawatts to utility machines generating hundreds of megawatts. This is a big fleet to learn from and has allowed FM Global to create a broad knowledge base from which to develop advice for our customers. That advice is developed in two ways. The first is through research conducted by specialists at our research campus and corporate headquarters in Rhode Island. The second is linked to the insurance side of our business. As an engineering company, our goal is to help our clients prevent losses. But as an insurance company, our goal is to make our clients whole again when they suffer losses. Our loss adjusters work incredibly hard to help those clients get back into operation as quickly as possible after an event. In tandem, our engineers investigate those losses to identify whether there are any learnings that can be used to improve our advice to other clients and prevent losses in the future. Over the last 10 years, our clients have suffered 183 steam turbine losses, totaling approximately one billion pounds in property damage and business interruption. Those losses, combined with the investigations that followed and the risk analysis that preceded them, enable us to develop a clear understanding of what a resilient machine looks like and conversely, what the signs are of a machine which is at a higher risk of suffering a loss. At this point, it would be worthwhile taking a moment to review how FM Global engineers analyze and assess the resilience of large industrial equipment, including turbines. This boiler and machinery piece is separate from the risk assessment done for fire and natural hazards and is performed by a second engineer. The relative importance of boiler and machinery varies quite widely with occupancies, such as offices, warehouses, and general manufacturing generally not suffering losses due to equipment breakdown. However, occupancies such as power generation and chemical and pharmaceutical manufacturing are sensitive to equipment breakdowns. In fact, at power generation locations, most losses, both in terms of number of losses and gross loss amount, is a result of equipment breakdown. At these locations, our boiler and machinery engineers analyze the key pieces of equipment using a standard methodology called equipment factors. This allows machines around the world and in different applications to be assessed uniformly and compared to identify those at higher risk. Each piece of equipment will be analyzed to assess how it is managed with regard to seven criteria. Firstly, Maintenance. Is it being inspected, maintained, and tested according to best practice and OEM recommendations? Operating conditions. Is it being operated within its design envelope, including cycling operations and process offsets? Environment. What, are the external, what is the external operating environment like, and is the service environment suitable for the equipment? For instance, has a cabinet with an IP54 rating been installed for outdoor use? Operators. How effective are the operators in ensuring equipment stays within design parameters during both normal and upset conditions? This is informed by a host of surrounding factors, including training and retraining, quality of standard and emergency operating procedures, and the authority that each operator has. History. Does the operating history of the equipment include breakdowns, process upsets, or other indicators of deteriorating remaining life? Safety devices. Are protection devices adequately designed, installed, maintained, and tested to ensure that equipment is protected from damage during normal and upset conditions? And finally, contingency planning. How well prepared is an organization to respond to and recover from the unplanned breakdown of a piece of equipment? FM Global's loss history shows that deficiencies in the first five equipment factors increase the likelihood of a loss, whilst deficiencies with the second two, with the last two, sorry, indicate that if a loss occurs, it is likely to be significantly larger. 
Having said that, it will become apparent in the coming slides that with regard to steam turbine safety devices, these can impact the likelihood as well as the severity. Now, if we cast our minds back to those 183 steam turbine losses that cost FM Global approximately 1 billion pounds over the last 10 years, this slide gives a clear indication of which equipment factors are driving those losses. The information gathered by engineers as part of their loss prevention consulting work prior to a loss, combined with post-loss investigation, enables identification of patterns and common denominators across losses. Analysis of this information shows that three equipment factors where deficiencies have a particularly outsized impact are maintenance, for instance, if a machine has exceeded its recommended outage interval, or at the last inspection, cracking was identified in the blade roots and an acceptable remedial plan has not been developed and implemented, these elements would increase the chances of equipment failure and hence a forced outage. Operating conditions. If a machine, for instance, is designed for base load conditions but is being too shifted without any appropriate management of change, the chances of having a bad day are going to go up. Similarly, not maintaining steam and water chemistry within design limits increases the risk on the machine. Finally, safety devices. If emergency stop valves are not being tested, or worse, are gagged, it is self-evident that the risk on that machine is high, significantly higher. The first two factors are beyond the scope of this webinar, as is the risk of fire on steam turbines. However, I will say this about turbine fires. The only significant combustible loading on a steam turbine is the oil, whether that be for lubrication, control, jacking, or seal. By definition, something mechanical must break before that oil can leave the pipe or tank it normally lives in in order to become ignited and, com and burn. Consequently, minimizing mechanical breakdowns will reduce the fire risk also. It is worth pointing out that fire-resistant industrial fluids can just about the remove the risk of fire altogether. These are commonly used in control oil systems but are unheard of for turbine lubrication in the Western world. The catastrophic nature of turbine fires led to significant research and development in the second half of the 20th century, resulting in the development of fire-resistant lubricants, most notably those of the phosphate ester variety. Similar products are commonly used in aero combustion turbines and aero derivative combustion turbines for obvious reasons. They also seem to be commonly used in Russia and parts of Asia, but not in the UK or other Western countries. After reading as much as I could find on the subject, there does not seem to be a compelling reason why new machines should not be supplied with these fluids. Generator insulation materials need to be carefully selected and the moisture content of the fluid needs to be managed. But given the technical expertise of turbine manufacturers, these do not seem to be insurmountable challenges. What are safety devices? It's possible to try to list all of the things that may be referred to as a safety device. But my brain does not retain long lists very effectively. I prefer to simplify it and boil it down to basics. The question I ask myself is, what do safety devices do? The picture on the left shows a 600 megawatt steam turbine generator, similar to those that would have been found in CGB stations built in the 60s and 70s. This machine is at a power station in the coal fields of South Africa, only a few miles away from where I started my career. In simplest terms, safety devices stop the picture on the left from becoming the picture on the right. The picture on the right is the aftermath of a, cat of a catastrophic overspeed event at the power station in South Africa. As these pictures demonstrate, equipment safety devices can have life safety implications too. If someone was unlucky enough to be standing near where any of this debris landed, the consequences could easily be fatal. However, the primary function of equipment safety devices in the context of turbines is to prevent upset conditions from causing damage to the turbine. This damage often leads to forced outages, business interruptions, and ultimately economic loss. So appropriate safety devices that are well managed are critical to protecting turbines from upset conditions. The next question is, how do these safety devices protect turbines from that damage? Firstly, they need to detect the process upset or fault condition. In the 21st century, fault detection is almost a given, with SIL-rated systems possessing incredible levels of reliability. 
On new turbines, it is normal to find electronic systems with multiple sensors and tripping channels, real-time error checking, and online testing and self-diagnosis. Consequently, the detection aspect is becoming less and less of a concern. The notable exception to this rule of thumb, though, is older turbines, which may still have mechanical overspeed protection. In this case, the detection element is a mechanical device prone to the typical failure mechanisms, mechanisms and so it needs to be tested, physically tested at full speed, at least annually. Secondly, the safety devices need to react to that fault detection by isolating the energy from the turbine. The normal flow of energy in the turbine process is for high temperature, high pressure steam to bring kinetic energy into the system and for it to be converted into electrical energy, which is removed through the generator circuit breaker. A fault condition results in an imbalance between the input and the output energy. That energy needs to be dissipated somewhere, so the faster the energy coming into the machine can be isolated, the less damage the turbine will suffer. The final action steam turbine safety devices need to complete is to maintain lubrication until the machine has run down. Lubrication failures don't often produce the spectacular visuals shown in the previous slides with turbines leaving the building, but they occur with alarming regularity and often lead to serious damage. As a company, FM Global averages approximately 100 million pounds a year in gross steam turbine losses around the world. Loss of lubrication events consistently make up around 50% of that figure. Maximizing the reliability of any device is a function of five elements. Design is incredibly important because it will impact everything that follows. There are two outcomes that make for a well-designed turbine safety device. Repeatable, reliable operation and the ability to prove repeatable, reliable operation whilst the turbine is in service. If a safety device cannot be proven whilst the machine is in service, it is of limited use. Unfortunately, the specter of value engineering looms large. Well-intentioned but naive cost optimization during the design phase often has dramatic effects on operational resilience. Inspection, testing, and maintenance are to some extent a function of design, but they are also dependent on the effectiveness of management systems and the diligence of operators to get the most out of them. Which leads us to the fifth and arguably most important factor, operators, the old organic safety device. There is no design so bad that it cannot be improved by a skilled and dedicated operator. Similarly, there are few designs so foolproof that they cannot be defeated by the combination of challenging circumstances and a badly prepared operator. In our experience, when a plant suffers a severe equipment breakdown, operators almost always play a role. We estimate that 70% of the time, that role serves to make a bad situation worse. 20% of the time, their impact is negligible and only 10% of the time do operators meaningfully contribute to making a bad day better. In these situations where operators make a bad day worse is not because they meant to. Very few people go to work with the intention of costing their employers money. Further on in this presentation, we will look at what factors improve the chances of those operators being part of the 10% rather than the 70%. As previously noted, fault detection on modern machines is generally very reliable. So the implication is that all five factors, design, inspection, testing, and maintenance, and operators are well implemented. So then the focus moves on to the tripping devices themselves. In the case of energy isolation, there are three potential sources of energy. The main steam supply, the bled or extract steam, and the electricity network, which the generator is connected to. The design of modern emergency stop valves is generally a good news story. If operated within the design envelopes, they last well between outages and operate reliably. They also generally allow testing whilst the turbine is online. When it comes to inspection, provided all risks have been minimized on the turbine, FM Global recommends a full internal inspection at no more than a five yearly interval. However, if there are relevant deficiencies such as water chemistry excursions or intermittent testing histories, a higher frequency would be recommended. With regard to testing, the predominant failure mode is a sticking valve which fails to close properly. This is often a consequence of poor water chemistry, but mechanical failure and other factors cannot be discounted. Partial stroke testing proves freedom of movement and should be completed weekly. However, that frequency can be increased to monthly if all necessary steps have been taken to minimize risks on the turbine. These include maintaining impeccable water chemistry, comprehensive test records, 
taking immediate action on any deficiencies that are found, annual overspeed testing and after significant maintenance, and full stroke testing on an annual basis. Finally, maintenance should be completed according to OEM recommendations or as conditions determine. The design of lead steam or extract steam non-return valves is a bit of a mixed bag. Historically, on large utility plants, this was well addressed with most valves allowing online testing. However, smaller plants, such as waste to energy or biomass locations, often have passive non-return valves installed without even an indication to prove position. In these instances, it is not possible to visualize the valve moving or to test it, hence making it impossible to confirm that that valve is in an operable condition. It is unclear what the reason for this is, but FM Global clients, including those operating turbines in the sub-100 megawatt range, have suffered losses due to malfunctioning non-return valves, leading to overspeed and overpressure events. As with ESVs, provided all risks have been minimized on the turbine, FM Global re recommends a full internal inspection at no more than five yearly intervals. However, if again, if there are relevant deficiencies such as water chemistry excursions or intermittent testing, a higher frequency would be recommended. Similarly to ESVs, maintenance should be completed per OEM recommendations or as conditions determine. The electrical grid can sometimes be overlooked as an energy source, but motoring events leading to catastrophic destruction of steam turbines account for some of the biggest losses in FM Global's history. From a design perspective, electrical switchgear, including generator circuit breakers, arrived at a good place some decades ago. The benefit of electrical reticulation systems is that by definition, there is redundancy included. Sometimes that redundancy includes tripping the rest of the plant or town, but the redundancy is nevertheless there. Inspections should be conducted similar to other switchgears with daily or weekly visual substation inspections and testing and maintenance according to OEM recommendations. What differentiates the electrical isolation from the steam isolation is the impact of operators. When it comes to steam, the intervention generally needs to be so quick that the operator doesn't have time to intervene in an appropriate way. However, when it comes to motoring events, the operator almost always has an opportunity to take action to reduce the impact of a motoring event. However, this generally requires the formulation and training on appropriate motoring response plans and operators having the authority to act appropriately. Finally, we get to lubrication and ensuring that the turbine is lubricated when it runs down after a trip. This is a schematic of a standard lubrication system on the turbine showing two AC pumps, a DC pump, filters, coolers, and the turbine and generator. The highlighted section in yellow shows the outlet of the DC pump, the emergency lube oil pump, being fed through the oil coolers and filters. The challenge with this is that it introduces a single point of failure. If the coolers are blocked or the filters are blocked, when the pressure drops on the lube oil system, the emergency lube oil pump will start and it will feed, try to feed lube oil through the same blockage that the AC pumps were feeding, potentially leading to a failure of lubrication on the turbine. FM Global recommends to its clients that the emergency lube oil supply is directed onto the bearings bypassing oil coolers and filters to ensure that any no such single point of failure exists. In addition to this, turbine operators should pay careful attention to the electrical supply of that DC system. Are there any single points of failure? Are there protection devices on those electrical pumps that ought not to be there? It is common to find thermal overload protection on DC emergency lube oil motors. These single points of failure should also be removed to maximize the resilience of the emergency lube oil supply. So, reviewing the lubrication system from the perspective of the elements which ensure resilience. The design of the turbine emergency lubrication system is of critical importance. Both the physical design 
ensuring that lube oil from the emergency pump is discharged directly onto the bearings and not through filters or any other single points of failure, but also the design of the electrical supply system. The electrical supply should not have any electrical protection installed, which could potentially trip the emergency lube oil supply whilst it is in operation. It is not uncommon to find thermal overload protection on emergency lube oil pumps. The battery should also be appropriately sized. Again, it is not uncommon to find battery systems supply sized to supply steady state DC loading and not taking into account the surge of loads that are put onto the system in a black site scenario. From an inspection perspective, lube oil systems should be subject to daily plant inspections and all valves should be secured to prevent accidental closure. Batteries should be inspected at least weekly and should be tested on a varying basis depending on the battery technology. Flooded lead acids and NICADs should be capacity tested on a five yearly basis and valve regulated lead acid batteries should be capacity tested every two years or replaced every three to four years. The emergency lube oil test system itself should be tested for a start stop functionality on a monthly basis. From a maintenance perspective, it is advisable at major turbine outages to confirm the flow and pressure of the emergency lube oil system. Operators, possibly the most important aspect of any power generation plant and most industrial locations. Sometimes, not very often, but sometimes, one arrives at a plant and the operators create this impression. Alarms are going off incessantly, temporary instructions are stuck to screens, there are posted notes on buttons saying do not push. However, every now and then you get to a plant and this is what you find. The only paperwork on the desk is the instructions that the operators are using there and then. There is no noise and only once every few minutes is there an audible notification from the system that the operator investigates and then acknowledges. But generally, the situation is somewhere in between. Maximizing operators' chances of responding successfully to an upset condition is a combination of factors. Quality of their training and retraining is clearly very important. So too is the management of change on the plant. Detailed yet easy to follow emergency operating procedures will enable an operator to take the correct actions during an upset condition and thus minimize the impact on the plant. Thorough and diligent alarm management also allows operators to focus on important information without having to acknowledge standard notifications that are not in fact alarms. Good shift handovers allow operators to know the status of their plant and the configuration that it's in and thus put them in a prime position to respond appropriately if an upset condition occurs. Finally, incident investigation is of paramount importance to ensure that lessons are learned and all of the other factors which affect the success chances of an operator reacting successfully are implemented appropriately. To recap, three takeaways from today's discussion on steam turbine safety devices are, firstly, that all of the energy should be isolated from the steam turbine. To do this, steam valves should be partially stroked on a weekly basis to ensure that they're gonna isolate steam if required, and a turbine motoring emergency procedure should be developed to maximize the chance of an operator be, to being able to successfully intervene in a turbine motoring event. Secondly, lubrication needs to be maintained. Emergency lube oil systems should be tested on a monthly basis to ensure that the emergency lube oil pump starts and batteries should be capacity tested on a two yearly basis for valve regulated lead acid batteries and on a five yearly basis for flooded lead acids or NICADs. And finally, but probably most importantly, operators need to be given every assistance they possibly can to help them be in the 10% that make a positive difference in an upset condition. Thank you very much for your time today. Does anybody have any questions?
Hello. Hello. So thank, thank you very much, much Donovan, for that. I'm hoping that we have fixed the echo problem and apologies to those of you listening uh, for that before. So Donovan, I believe you and I can hear each other. So uh, if you can indicate whether you can hear an echo before we move into the Q&A. I've, I've got, got no echo on my side. Time. Okay. Let me just have a look at the questions that are coming in to see if you guys are reporting an echo before we move on with the Q&A. So we're, we're not, not, so that is, so I'm going to go on the basis that you guys can hear me, okay? So again, apologies before. So, so Donovan, thank you very much for that, uh, for that presentation. Um, excellent stuff. We have a number of questions, which is great. So, uh, without further ado, I will launch straight into those. Um, they're not in any particular order, so apologies, Don, you'll have to pick up on the thread of those. Uh, but here it goes. So the first question we have is from Michael from Worley. Uh, Michael says, hydrogen fires are also common, especially with failures of oil seals, uh, especially with the incident of the South African turbine fire. Um, should this be a consideration too? Is it true these days that there are additives that are added in the oil to increase its resilience to fire? Thanks, Michael, for the question. Um, I guess in short, my answer is I'm not aware of any additives um, that can be that can be introduced to the oil to meaningfully reduce the fire risk. Um, there may be some in in development, but as far as I know, the only thing that I've come across so far that meaningfully changes the the fire risk on a on a steam turbine is using fire resistant lubricant uh, such as phosphate ester type products that are commonly used in. Um, in aero combustion turbines and aero derivative combustion turbines. Thanks, Thanks Simon. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, Donovan. Okay. okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, let me find another one. one. So, so the, the next, next question, question comes, comes in from, from AJ, AJ uh, who's a senior, senior engineer. engear. Uh, my, my question, question is, what protections, protections are preferred for sudden vacuum failure? AJ, very good question. Um, we don't necessarily recommend specific protections on the, the loss of vacuum, but that is largely tied to the fact that the, the impact of that will generally not be felt in a, in a significant insured event. Um, so from an operational perspective, the, the impact would be significant if you're losing vacuum on a regular basis and, and suddenly. Um, but generally speaking, you will see that I believe, and I'm an electrical engineer, so I'm not a, a, a mechanical specialist or um, a, 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 a metallurgical specialist, but I suspect what you'll see there is a, is a reduction in the life of the turbine rather than um, a discrete event at that point that takes the turbine out of service. Thanks Thank very you very much. much. Thank, Thank you, Donovan. So the, the next question we have is from Barry from Triton Power. Don, you stated that lead acid batteries, DC emergency supplies, should be replaced every three to four years. Is this realistic? Most lead acid battery systems in the UK power plants are in service for 10 to 20 years without an issue. Drop tests and regular maintenance are the norm. Please can you clarify where the replacement frequency has been derived from? Again, great, great question. question. Um, um, and I, I think, think to clarify, clarify, the recommendation is on valve regulated lead acid batteries. batteries. And, and, and I apologize if I wasn't specific about, uh, about that in the presentation. Um, the drive here is that flooded lead acids are, are well known, they're pretty robust, their limitations um, are, are well appreciated. Valve regulated lead acid batteries, which have seen an absolute explosion in their use over the last sort of five to ten years. Um, I think their limitations and idiosyncrasies are slightly less well appreciated, although becoming more and more well appreciated as, as time goes on. Um, they're susceptible to um, environmental variations. You know, if the temperature's too hot or if the temperature's too cold, it shortens their life. They're, they're susceptible, susceptible to um, excessive, excessive ripple, ripple on the on the charging, charging current, current, which also shortens, shortens their, their life. life. Um, 
deep discharges problems. Problem. So I think the challenges with valve regulated lead acid batteries rather than flooded. And again, I apologize if, I, if that wasn't clear in the, in the presentation. Thanks, Simon. Thank, Thank you, Donovan. Uh, one person had reported a, an echo, so I'm not sure if that's still ongoing. If it is, I do apologize to those of you listening. We are trying to, to address that. Uh, next question is from um, Vikram uh, from Unison, uh, who says, um, can you please again explain the hazard and why should DC pump supply should bypass oil coolers and oil filters? Absolutely, Vikram. Um, the challenge here is that you're introducing a common failure mechanism between the main oil supply and the emergency oil supply. So, so if, for instance, your standard, standard setup where you've got a duplex filter arrangement and ordinarily what happens is you run one of those filters until you get a high differential pressure across the filter, you change over to the next filter and all is well with the world. We have had instances where people change over either onto a block filter or there is an issue with the changeover mechanism where you then are... Um, reducing the flow of oil to your turbine. So the pressure at your bearings drops or the temperature of your bearings picks up. It detects that it needs uh, emergency lube oil supply. The emergency lube oil supply kicks in, but it is then feeding through that same failure mechanism that has hindered the main oil supply, then thus preventing the bearings from being lubricated, which is why we always recommend having effectively a direct feed from the emergency lube oil discharge Onto, onto the bearing so that there is no failure mechanism between those between, between, those, between those two points, points so that you've got maximum, maximum chance of the oil that is discharged from the emergency lube oil pump finding its way onto the bearings and maintaining lubrication until the turbine runs down. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Donovan. Uh, related to that, um, Uzia from the Hub Power Company says, can the DC lube oil pump discharge in, in the, the same header, header line to, to which our AC loop oil pump discharge. Yes, and that that's generally what we find on site. It's it's discharging to the same line, but it's post the coolers and the filters. So effectively, all you've got is a length of pipe between your emergency lube oil pump and your point of consumption, your bearings. Thank you for the question. Next question, Simon. Thank, Thank you, Donovan. Sorry, Sorry we're toggling mute on and off here to try and cope with the echo. So hopefully, for you listening, that's okay. Um, next, next question is from David from Air Products. Can you use a risk based approach to determine inspection and testing intervals, e.g., LOPA or FMEA? Yes, is the short answer, Richard. Um, I, it depends on a number of different factors. So we have some level of flexibility in, in what we recommend to our clients, depending on the risks that we find on site. So, for instance, if you look at um, uh, steam valve testing, for instance, where ordinarily we would be looking at a, a weekly frequency for partial stroke testing on emergency stop valves and on um, blend steam on returns, we envisage being able to stretch that to a four-weekly schedule if everything else is absolutely shipshape and there are no other risks on that machine. So water chemistry is tightly controlled, test records are, are, are very well maintained, any excursions are thoroughly investigated and appropriately addressed. So yes, there is scope to address a risk-based, um, to, to apply a risk-based approach, but again, within fairly narrow parameters because these are ultimately your last lines of defense, so you still need to be 100% sure that they're going to operate um, as you would like them to. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, thank you, Donovan. Uh, next question is from Adam from RWE. What is your experience with using condition-based monitoring for overspeed protection devices, emergency shutdown valves, etc.? Can condition-based maintenance be used instead of periodic valve overhaul? Again, Adam, I, I suppose linked to an extent to the, to, to the previous question, there is scope for condition-based monitoring. So, for instance, if you're looking at valve overhauls um, where we have a 
minimum frequency of five year where, where but, but you can, can uh, you would need to make that shorter and be doing it more regularly if for instance there were all chemistry excursions and you had concerns about scaling if there had been any um evidence of sticking when you were testing valves so there is there is some scope to use condition-based monitoring but um from a time perspective and especially on the modern equipment the sorts of testing that we're recommending at the frequencies that we are on modern equipment we haven't found it to be or certainly the feedback from our clients is that um if the equipment is appropriately designed it's not overly intrusive to achieve those frequencies on the testing um, and then again the, the maintenance really falls within our scope, scope by and large um, and, and so those frequencies, frequencies tend to align thank you thank, thank you Donovan. Donovan. uh planning, planning on, on we've got, got a number, number of questions, questions. So, so, again thanks to the audience for uh for being very interactive on this session uh, uh, next, next question comes from robert from munich re regarding electronic overspeed protection what would you recommend actual overspeed testing for such systems Um, Robert, not necessarily, no, because you, you can test that system perfectly adequately without physically overspeeding the machine, and that was um, it's one of the benefits of these systems, right, is that if you drop your set point down to 90% or 50% or 40%, whatever it is, below synchronous speed, you're still testing the whole system from end to end. You're testing the detection aspect because your speed probes are still detecting the speed, um, and the speed probes are generally used for turbine control anyway, so you are generally pretty confident in the accuracy of that part of the system. And then you then testing the, um, the tripping system all the way up to the point where you're isolating energy. So, no, you wouldn't have to physically overspeed it. You don't have to, and that's one of the benefits of electronic systems, is that you don't have to, you don't have to induce the fault condition in order to test the protection. Thank you. Thank you, Donovan. Uh, sorry, just make sure that I don't have you on mute again. Just give me one second. Mo. Excellent. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, Donovan. Donovan. Uh, uh, next, next question comes from Jürgen at Siemens Energy. Energy. Would you share on request detailed best practice, practice for the recommended turbine motoring emergency procedure? Uh, in short, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Right. Right. And, and I, I, I think, think probably worth adding that, that as, As with many of these challenges, challenges there's a few different ways to, to skin the cat. cat. Um, so what's good at one site might not necessarily apply at the other site. But yeah, we can certainly, we would be happy to have a discussion about um, what elements we've seen in, in plans that have worked very well and have given us a large degree of, of confidence that in a motoring event, um, an operator is going to take the necessary steps to prevent significant damage to that machine. Absolutely, Absolutely, Jürgen, and, and, and my contact, contact details were, were up a little while ago, but um, the IMAC can, can definitely put us in, in, in contact, contact and we can have that discussion. Thank, Thank you, Donovan. Donovan. Uh, the, the next question, question I have is going to challenge me on the pronunciation, so I do apologise. Um, I believe the question comes from Wu, and is from the Liang Yang Ying New Energy Company. And the question is, do we have good isolation method to isolate the main streamline, steam line, and oil line? If we have any leakage of oil piping, there is a big risk. I'm not 100% sure I understand, I understand the question. The question so I'm, I'm absolutely honest. honest. Um, so I'm just, just trying to find on our list, list if I so can. Do, do we have a good isolation method to locate to sorry, sorry isolate, isolate the main steam line and the oil line. I think perhaps we can take that one separately. Um, I, I, think I think we can. can. I mean, my, my initial response is yes, in the sense that you have your emergency stop valves and you have your isolation valves on the on the steam system, um, and on the oil system, there are generally isolation valves. But you'd like to manage those very carefully, right? Um, you need to make sure that those valves are key controlled as you would any critical safety valve um, to ensure that there's no chance of your turbine being starved of oil. Thank you, Donovan. Next, Next question is from Bikram at Unison. What are the most important non-destructive tests suggested for steam turbines? 
Vikram, Vikram, very good question. question. Um, and, and again, again I, need I need to preface with this, this with the fact that, that, that I'm not a metallurgist and I'm not a rotating equipment expert. Um, I have I have experience with steam turbines and I've worked a lot with them in the, in the loss prevention sphere. But I think as with most inspections, the first step is going to be the visual inspection, right? It's human eyes um, and, and putting eyes on the turbine and seeing what, what you find um, is the, 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 the first step to doing it. Uh, one of the elements that crops up often in, in our environment is what non-destructive examination should be being done to eliminate the possibility of cracking on stress rises. So traditionally you're seeing this in the in the roots and slots of the steam turbine blading. Um, and we often have these conversations with clients and OEMs around the best way of, um, of, of proving that that's not a concern, I think. Um, we know it's a, it's a susceptibility of all steam turbines and ultimately our goal is to help our clients be absolutely confident that they are not going to um, fall foul of a, of a crack that propagates and lands up um, in, a, in a blade liberation event. Uh, but it's a, very detailed, um, it's a very detailed topic and we land up having quite in-depth conversations with both our clients and the OEMs as to what's appropriate on any given turbine. Uh, thank, thank you, Donovan. Donovan. Um, I think some people are experiencing an echo, so I guess just make sure that you're toggling in between phone on, phone off, and uh, that's what muted. Uh, next question comes from Daniel at Man Energy Systems. Um, apologies if this was covered during the presentation, and apologies from me too, because I can't remember. Um, regarding physical overspeed testing, turbine OEMs normally will recommend physical testing based on hours or after a major overhaul or failure. Does FMO will recommend a time-based testing regime? Ultimately, this could reduce the lifespan of the components. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for the question, Daniel. I think when it comes to overspeed, it's important to distinguish between the old mechanical overspeed protection, the sort of bolt and plunger arrangement versus the newer electronic overspeed protection. Um, if you're looking at the mechanical overspeed, we do recommend at least annually and when you come back from a major service, i.e. a rotor arc type, um, type overhaul of your turbine. The reason being that the bolt assembly is a mechanical device, right? So it's prone to seizing, it's prone to sticking like any mechanical device if it's not operated on a, on a regular basis. So that is the challenge with, with turbines that are protected with mechanical overspeed protection is that one of the reasons you'd like physically overspeed it on, an, on at least an annual basis is to ensure that that bolt is moving, that you have freedom of movement and, and it's gonna activate when you need it to. On electronic overspeed, we also recommend um, an, an annual basis and when coming back from major overhaul, but again, as discussed previously, the, the benefit of the electronic overspeed systems by and large is that you can reduce the set point and test your overspeed protection without physically overspeeding the device. Um, so hence you're not shortening the life of the, of the machine. Thank you. Thank you, Donovan. Uh, next question is from uh, Dougie at Nuclear Risk Insurers. Are you able to share industry or applications where you have observed very good practices, say for example, operators or maintenance, i.e. perhaps comment on the top 10% or where you see poorer practices, i.e. the bottom 10%. Any thoughts on that, Tom? <laughs> that's, a, that's a minefield question, that. Um, I would suggest that where um, we've seen very good practices are in the big utility-type organizations that have got economies of scale. They have had the benefit of learning um, out of the the, 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 the the benefit of learning from their fleets so that um, they have developed their own procedures and their own best practices. Um, we did some work with, uh, I think it's probably fair to say, or we don't, uh, Uniper and the old CEGB in this country, uh, generally incredibly good procedures and really on top of, um, on, on, on top of how they manage their assets. I think where you see challenges in asset management is in, industries and environments where the um, profit margins are perhaps thinner so you don't have the um, the ability to invest as much or in single locations where by definition you might have an electrical engineer 
an instruments engineer, um, a mechanical engineer, and some technicians, they don't necessarily have the ability to have an entire section of their workforce dedicated to um, analyzing performances, deriving procedures to improve that performance, analyzing losses or analyzing big events and doing the RCAs on those, on those detailed RCAs on those big events. So I think it's probably fair to say that um, in industries where their bread and butter is, is operating a steam turbine and that's their core business. So the old thermal power stations, for instance, you, um, they have both the resources and the appreciation to address those issues um, of all of the main issues that you see on a steam turbine. Where we see areas for improvement oftentimes is in environments where running a steam turbine is sort of ancillary to their normal operation. So you would have a steam turbine driving a large compressor or some cogeneration on site where generating power is really secondary to the main industrial um, activity going on on site. Thank you for the question. Thank, Thank you very, very much, Donovan. Donovan. Uh, next, next question um, comes from uh, Michael at Worley. Is there any operating experience that is shared across the operators of steam turbines to support lessons learned initiatives? Good question, Michael. I'm not sure that I can comment on the wider steam turbine fraternity, but what I can say is that within the FM Global community, that is one of the benefits that our clients derive from um, from working with us is that we get to disseminate all of the lessons that we've learned on the thousand odd steam turbines that we ensure we then get to distribute to all of our clients. Um, so I've had the, the the misfortune of being intimately involved with some of my clients on some steam turbine losses. Um, but what that's meant is we do a thorough investigation. So when we have, when one of our clients um, has a bad day like that, it's not only loss adjusters who attend their site, it's also our loss prevention engineers who go and have a chat with the clients, perform an investigation to confirm whether there are any learnings that we should be taking to disseminate to our wider client base as to what they can be learning to make their machines um, more resilient. So certainly that's something that we do internally. I um, would be hugely surprised if the, the steam turbine fraternity within the UK doesn't have a larger group, um, but I don't necessarily have the contact details of those to hand as we speak now. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Donovan. Uh, right, let me go to the next question, trying to give us a selection. Um, next question is from Andrew at uh, Sarika Energy. Do you have any data on the various subsystems uh, and their respective causes of turbine failure? For example, valves, bearings, instrumentations, or control systems. Any comments on the biggest cause of failures? Again, tough question. I don't think that we would have information on that only because we tend not to classify the causes based upon the specific piece of equipment that leads up to that cause. So it'd rather be um, classified according to the equipment factors that I described and where there's a deficiency in those or where there's an opportunity to improve resilience in those, what how that is driving um, those breakdowns. What I can tell you is of the, the examples that you, you stipulated there, um, lubrication, if we could eliminate all lubrication issues from all of the steam turbines that we ensure, we would be reducing probably by somewhere between a third and a half, the number of steam turbine losses that our clients suffer. Um, but with regard to the other specific components, I'm afraid I can't comment on that. Thank Thanks you for the, the question. question uh, Thanks, Thanks Don. Don. Um, next, next question comes, comes from um, uh, Proto Marine. Marine. Um, um, have, have, we, have, have you seen any differences, differences between land-based and marine-based turbine? turbine plants uh, with regards to safety devices or failures? Great question. Um, and I have some guys, there are some guys, colleagues of mine who would be able to answer it um, because they come from naval backgrounds, but we don't do a lot of business with uh, marine-based turbines. We don't insure um, ships as such. So we, as, as a fraternity, we don't have a lot of experience working on marine-based turbines, although some of my ex-naval colleagues would have been able to comment had they been on the call. Uh, thank, thank you, Donovan. Donovan. Uh, we're just nearing our time. Um, I will let me just reference uh, one comment actually from Jürgen Stevens. Then he should say thank you, Jürgen. 
Uh, uh, Jürgen said, said, could you please advertise your valuable FM verbal, verbal data sheet? sheet? Um, we'll be delighted to do so. For those of you on the call, um, um, thank you, Jürgen, for bringing that to the attention. Uh, if you just Google FM Global Data Sheet, um, as many of you, I'm sure, will know, that information and access to that is freely available to any and all. So if you just Google FM Global Data Sheet, uh, it'll take you to it, or you can visit fmglobal.com, and that will also take you through a link to our data sheet. So please feel free to, uh, uh, to go have a look there. Um, right, I think we've probably got time for a couple more questions that I will just squeeze in. So give me one second. Um, Don, a question from myself, if I may. Um, have safety devices evolved at all on steam turbines? Any comment in terms of, of what we're seeing now, perhaps on newer plants, with perhaps what we're seeing on older plants? Yeah, great question, Simon. I think, um, yeah, the evolution of, of Steam turbine safety devices over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years is generally a good news story. Um, I think we've spoken about it at, at some length today already. One of the positives is the uh, um, transition away from mechanical overspeed devices to electronic overspeed devices. Um, and I think we've touched on a few of the reasons why, why those are preferable. Um, I think by and large, the arrangement of emergency lube oil systems has improved. So most new turbines that I see today uh, the emergency lube oil system is piped directly onto the bearings rather than via um, points of failure like the coolers and the filters. Um, but I, there's still some work to be done, right? There's still some opportunities to improve the resilience um, and some of the things I've already touched on, for instance. So um, on the DC system supplying that emergency lube oil uh, uh, pump motor, what is the protection philosophy on there? Do we have trips that shouldn't necessarily be trips, for instance, a so thermal overload on the on the pump motor um i've yet to hear a, a cogent argument why there should be thermal overload on those motors if your emergency lube oil system is is operating you would surely want it to keep operating for as long as it possibly could to ensure your turbine runs down with as much lubrication as possible um one of my uh one of my my, my pet subject is the batteries that supply those um dc systems and the technology selection uh, I think for, for some fairly understandable reasons, valve-regulated lead-acid batteries have become incredibly popular, not least of which is that at the purchase point, they are significantly cheaper than competing technologies. Um, but as I alluded to earlier, their sensitivities are starting to be better and better understood, um, their sensitivity to environmental factors, their sensitivity to overcharging, ripple currents, um, and their life, even if they're looked after, is, is a fair bit shorter. Whereas if you look at the other technologies, and uh, the one I like best is NICAD, because a NICAD battery is incredibly robust to both environmental factors, to how it's charged, how it's managed, but it's also got an incredibly long life. So if you look at um, waste to energy, for instance, which is, a, which is a growth industry in this country, and where we're seeing a lot of new steam turbines installed, the initial design life of those plants, they're looking at sort of 20, 30 years, but they've got batteries being installed that need to be replaced every five years, 10 years if you're stretching it. But I would argue that you probably don't want to be stretching the battery life on your turbines. Whereas if you install NICAD batteries, you have one set of batteries for anywhere between 15 and 20 years. So the lifetime cost of that of that battery installation is comparable, if not better than, than the valve regulators, but it just needs to, it needs to be spec'd at the outset. So, um, so on the whole, a good news story, but but we've still got some some room to improve. I think. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Simon. So, so we're, we're at time. time. Thank, Thank you very much, much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. us. Uh, copies of the presentation will be made available. Uh, apologies, apologies for the technical issues. issues. Uh, Thank, Thank you for bearing with us. With us. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. today. I hope you found it useful. Um, stay stay safe, safe and uh, many, many thanks, thanks for joining us. us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody.